Prime Minister, thanks so much for talking to us. Estonia has given around a third of its uh, annual military aid budget to Ukraine. That's the highest per capita of any nation. Why have you made such a huge commitment to Ukraine? We know from our own history that fighting for freedom uh, with the aggressive neighbour is something that you just can't lose. And that's why we are giving all the military aid to Ukraine that we can. And I, I hope that others will do as well. I think it's very important that this war will end and the war can only end when Russia goes back to its borders. Because if this aggression uh, pays off, uh, there, it serves and as, as an invitation to use it elsewhere and I think it's very dangerous for the international uh, law and rule, rules-based order. You even gave military aid to Ukraine before the yeah. war began. Did you get any indication about how helpful that was to Ukraine in those critical early weeks? Uh, yes, of course, it was very, very help helpful. We uh, knew from our intelligence that the war is probably going to start. We also made our own decisions to boost our defence before the war started. Uh, because, uh, you know, if, if the war is really starting, everybody's going into the procurements uh, to, to boost their defence expenditure, and we tried to do it before. But yes, Ukrainians have been very grateful for our help. Um, this uh, first uh, first days and, and afterwards as well, we have been talking to our bigger allies to give more. If such a small country like us can give so much, then I believe that the others have something in stock that they can also give. As the leader of a country that shares a 300 kilometre border with Russia, you know your neighbour better than most nations. Do you share any optimism that Putin's appetite to continue this war may be diminishing? It is only diminishing when uh, he does not win this war and he's not off with uh, some additional territories that he has gained due to, to this aggression. Because right now the occupied territories are um, over Three, size, the size, uh, three times the size of Switzerland. So, so he has already gained a lot. When, when there are calls now that let's stop here, everybody stays where they are, they have actually gained a lot of territories. And that's why it's very important that they can't win this war and they will be uh, going back to their borders. Because if, if they gain the territories, it serves uh, as an invitation that you can do this all over again because you are not punished for this. And we have seen this already before in, in 2007, Georgia, uh, Donbas, Crimea, and every time actually uh, Russia has been more, um, um, well, not really ashamed of what they are doing. Before, I mean, in Crimea, they were saying that it's the little green men, it's not Russian soldiers. Now they are openly waging a war on Ukraine. They are uh, Russian soldiers, there is propaganda uh, that is uh, uh, somehow um, trying to convince everybody that this is the war for the good cause, which is Nobody, I think, believes that, but anyway, they are trying to do this because every time uh, they see that they got off with no punishment and every next time it's, it will be worse. In what way have Western leaders misunderstood Putin in the past 23 years? Um, the Western leaders see Putin or try to see Putin through this democratic lens uh, so that as they see the world. Uh, when you are a leader of a democratic country, you are held responsible for your actions and decisions. Uh, you know, elections come and you are, uh, you are voted out if, if people don't like what you are doing. In dictatorships, it does not work that way. And that's why I think the Western leaders have judged this on the basis of, of their, uh, their uh, democratic way of, of doing things and that is something that uh, you can't really put to the autocrats. There is a very good book uh, that I have recommended to to uh, some of the Western leaders called The Dictator's Handbook, actually giving uh, the, the real, real textbook how they operate. And how do they react when you give them that book and say read this about Putin? 
Well, uh, they're grateful. <laughs> I, I think what, what has changed um, since uh, 24th of February uh, is that we are being listened to more than, more than ever. But I, I, I also see that there is this attention span that is, is limited uh, because new worries come also in internal politics. And, and this is, uh, um, I mean, the war fatigue kicks in and, and all these things. So, so we constantly need to talk about this. Um, when we see and hear the calls for diplomatic solution again. What is the diplomatic solution? I mean, there is a very good solution when Russia goes back to their borders. If we try to negotiate so that they are left with something that they have occupied, I mean, what does it really say? This pays off and, and I think it's, a, as I said before, it's a threat to the international rules-based order because, you know, it pays off to attack your neighbours. Putin has a key advantage in all of this in that he does not have to face proper elections. And there are European nations heavily dependent on Russian gas about to go into a winter. Suddenly with those cost of living pressures, inflation in double digits, some of those democracies and those leaders are going to face intense pressure. Are you concerned that some of those European nations might start wavering when they get domestic pressure? Yes, uh, as I said, uh, the domestic worries kick in. Uh, high energy prices, high inflation. We have here the highest inflation in Europe, but I see the inflation as a war tax. We are paying this in euros or dollars or, or uh, francs or pounds, but uh, Ukrainians are paying this with human lives. And I think, again, uh, that's why we should focus on ener our energy on ending this war, because all these high energy prices, high inflation actually stem from the war st still going on. And that's why we have to focus our energy there. But it's, it's becoming more and more difficult because those countries who have much better neighbours than we do have, uh, then uh, they don't feel this threat as so clear or it, they don't feel that this is connected to the war that is going on. Your family and your nation know all too well the pain of, of being occupied by a foreign nation and being occupied by the Soviet Union. Can you tell us what happened to your mother's family when the Soviet Union occupied your country in the 1940s? Yes, I've used this example to explain to people who say that, you know, if they're, I mean, the ultimate goal is, is peace. Um, when we had peace uh, after the Second World War, uh, our part of Europe uh, suffered uh, immensely after the peace was, or, or the Second World War was over. Uh, also in Estonia we had mass deportations, we had repressions and, and every family in Estonia has a story like this. My uh, family story is that my mother was a six months old baby together with uh, uh, my grandmother and great grandmother were sent to Siberia in cattle wagons for uh, the trip or the journey took three months. It was March, it was super cold. Uh, and they survived and came back afterwards. My grandfather was sent to a Siberian prison camp, uh, but uh, many didn't. And this is the same that we will see uh, when uh, the territories will remain occupied in, in Ukraine by the Russians. You have said that Russia needs to be held for accountable for what it's done in Ukraine, both through war crimes prosecutions but also through the rebuilding of that country and making sure that they pay that price. How do you make a rogue nation with nuclear weapons accountable in this way? Yeah, I think it's very important that we get the message across that you will pay for everything. Uh, I, I think it's, it's wrong to say to the taxpayers of uh, European countries that we have to build up Ukraine. No, uh, Russia has to pay for every building destroyed, every bridge ruined. Uh, they have to pay for this. I have uh, proposed, um, uh, uh, I mean, you, 
you brought up the idea of, of uh, gas dependency and I see that there is a reluctance to put a sanction on gas but I have proposed that we could have this kind of escrow account that you still pay for Russia for the gas but you pay to a special escrow account because Russia owns Ukraine for the war damages and we owe or the countries who use Russian energy owe for the energy so you pay to this escrow account and we can kill several flies at the same time first you get the message uh, to Russia that uh, that uh, you know you have to pay for everything you destroy also your taxpayers uh, second is that uh, that uh, we already have the money uh, we don't have to claim anything and I as a lawyer by profession I know very well that you are in a stronger position when you have something and you don't have to claim this and, and the third is that we already uh, can use this uh, money to, to build up uh, uh, Ukraine when the war is over and we see uh, the damage that has been caused. Your government has been pushing to ban Russian tourists coming over the border and wants the EU to have a, a ban on Russian tourists transiting through those countries. Why is that important? Because a lot of people would say, hang on a second, these are Russian citizens you're punishing, you're, you're not punishing the administration. Yes, but it's also Russian citizens that are fighting in Ukraine and it's also uh, every citizen is responsible for their country's deeds. Yes, I know in, in autocracies it's much more difficult to do that, but still, I mean, I think it's pain, <laughs> plain wrong that uh, Russians can freely enjoy their vacation while their country is waging a war on Ukraine and killing and torturing people in Ukraine, which is in Europe. Uh, so, uh, we are not advocating for an outright ban. We still have humanitarian visas, you still can visit your uh, family and, and relatives, but, but going to Europe uh, for a vacation, uh, I think it's a privilege uh, that should not be used while your country is waging a war. You pay the price and, and actually the sanctions that we have already in place, we have air travel sanctions, so there are no planes coming from Russia to Europe. But uh, so that this is also affecting the regular citizens. But the three countries that have a land border with Russia, Finland, Estonia and uh, Latvia are bearing the burden and I think it's just just wrong uh, that we have to do this. And, and uh, also one important point is that only 30% of Russian citizens have a foreign passport, which means that they can travel outside Russia. And these are the people coming from the Moscovite and St. Petersburg elite. Uh, if anybody in Russia, then those elites can have uh, influence over the Kremlin's decisions. If they are hurting, they will put the pressure on, on Putin. So, so therefore, I, I have advocated for this, uh, this ban to be really effective. And, and the final point is that we see the painful reaction from the side of, of Russia. Uh, which means that th this is something that they are really afraid of. So, so we should use that. And my final, final point is that uh, if we are talking about, or when we are talking about sanctions uh, in Europe, we always try to select the ones that hurt the other side more than they hurt our side. Uh, for example, the gas uh, was put on pause because it hurts um, several European countries more than it does hurt uh, uh, Russia. But uh, banning the tourists is, is not hurting our side, but Russian side. Prime Minister Kallis, thanks so much for talking to us. Appreciate your time. Thank you.